All right, we are live. Thanks everybody for joining in. Tom Dimitrovich here and David Thanks. Smith. How's it awesome. going, Tom? Good to see you, David. <laughs> Thanks for uh, joining in again. I appreciate uh, appreciate you uh, uh, pitching in at five o'clock p.m. when we should be having festivities. <laughs> this is the festivities, right? Like that's right. This is the happy hour. This is the Tommy D happy hour, and I'm happy to be here. Let's talk. Was it eat tech talk? More than happy to have it. Should have had some libations ready to go, but that's okay. <laughs> that's okay. Perfect. Perfect. So today's topic was really your st your st you stimulated this idea, and I and I I thought it was just absolutely awesome because I know we're we're, we're creating some other materials which I'm not going to talk about. Uh, but um, why don't you why don't you just just do a quick introduction of surviving in your own home? Sure, absolutely. So the original idea that we had about this was essentially Christmas time. You know, what are the, some of the things that you know make your house possibly dangerous? That could be some type of safety issue uh, whenever it comes to Christmas. And then we decided, why do we have to make it holiday season related? There are plenty of things that are outside of the holiday season. Um, that are particularly dangerous around anybody's home, uh, even in the United States. Um, just because, you know, the world, the world leader and everything doesn't mean that our homes aren't particularly dangerous, and they might be dangerous in different ways than somebody else's. And so um, with all of the good things that we have here, there are still some potentially dangerous stuff that's around everybody's home. And so we just wanted to go through some of the indicators of things that you might, you know, some things are obvious, right? But some things are not quite as obvious. And so might as well go ahead. And if there's one thing that's going on in somebody's house, or you might hear about some neighbor or some friend says, hey, you know what? I know you're in the electrical industry. Um, hey, can you help me diagnose this particular problem? These are some things that you might not automatically think that are, you know, red flags as soon as you hear about them. But we might as well go through the possibilities of what could be going on and hopefully save a life. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, and to your point, the, um, the, what we're going to talk about this whole aspect of surviving in your, in your home is not, is not just a U.S. based thing. I mean, this program is international, right? So we have people from India, we have people from China, uh, Japan was on the other day, uh, Canada, uh, uh, we got Felix Sandoval. We got Nihad El Sharif, who's over there. Are you? I don't. I, I don't know. Hopefully, he's. Uh, I don't know if he's still in Egypt. Hopefully, all is well with Nihad. So we've got a lot of people from across the globe. And electricity. You know what I love, David? Electricity does not know. Electrons don't know. Ah. Right, they, the what country they're in, what structure they're in, they don't really care. They don't speak a language. They don't. Uh, they don't know Spanish and English and and Japanese and all this other good stuff. They don't care. So, uh, electrical safety is an important topic, regardless of where you're at. And a lot of what we're going to talk about now, we might show and share some statistics, like the Consumer Product Safety Commission, right, is one of our uh, topics and and a resource. So. If uh, for everybody who's watching this, I put links uh, and David and I assembled some links that uh, for resources and the Consumer Product Safety Commission is a United States thing. I'm sure uh, it, that guys like Nihad and Santiago and uh, and others in other countries, they probably know of reference materials that possibly their government or organizations put together that brings data together and, and gets it on the table. So if you know all of that, um, please share that in the comments, in the chat, so that we have that on record. Uh, because if you have a resource, it's great to have data on the table. And we got James Smith in the house. David Smith, James Smith, do you guys know each other? Come on. How about that? I know, I, hey, James. <laughs> I told James we're going to have to do a family tree now. I mean, it's come true. on. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So what if, uh, so uh, just uh, before we get into, let's talk a little bit about industry news. We always talk about industry news. You gave us a good update. Do you have anything new to report or, or anything, any comments? So nothing very pressing at this point, um, just to go back and you dial back, rewind a little bit for anybody who wasn't on the last show that I was ended up on. Uh, I'm the codes and standards specialist for even for particularly for this division. And so um, I particularly pay attention to all of the local state adoption um, throughout the United States. And so 
Uh, the one update I did want to give is that on April 1st, Oregon and Iowa are going to be updating to the 2020 NEC. And so both of them have a little bit different interpretations and amendments are going on state by state. And so if you are either in Oregon or in Iowa or do business in any of those, either of those states, um, I would recommend checking out their state websites to see exactly um, what the code is going to be like in that particular area and all the installations uh, going forward after April 1st. Yeah, you know, California, and I believe Oregon is looking at this too. California was talking about, it, no, they didn't want gas in the house. And I, and I suppose that's because of earthquakes and all of the wildfires and stuff like that are occurring, right? So, so I know they were talking about trying to make all electric homes. There's all, you know, we know California is putting PV on every roof. I know right. EV is big and, and Portland and Oregon is doing the same, having the same discussions. I'm not sure where they're at in their code process. If they've, uh, I know they were talking about having EV ready and PV ready homes. So, and you, and we all know what happens and it works its way across the country. So, um, you know, that's something to keep an eye on to your point. Now with regard to, you know, we're doing a lot of, uh, we're doing a lot of uh, online stuff, which I personally, what we're doing here today and what my Tech Thursdays, I'm hoping that I can maintain that even when we start to travel because I uh, I think it is a value to the industry. I'm getting a lot of positive feedback, but what are you seeing? Are you, are, you know, I know we have the, the vaccine out and things like that, but, uh, you know, are you here? I'm hearing... First half is still tight, but the second right. half is opening up. What do you What are your thoughts? That seems to be what I'm hearing as well. Um, you know, I'm a little bit farther down the list uh, for people that are going to be getting jabbed in their arms. Some other people, but uh, I'm not complaining. But um, but I have been hearing exactly that. And so what we are seeing is that some um, major events, you know, the IEI section meetings, what it appears the just IEI, just for example, um, they appear to be um, rolling it out in person as if. Um, everything is going to be essentially taken care of or largely cleared up by uh, that part of the year, which is normally September. And that seems to be the way that the entire electrical industry is kind of going about it. Anything the first half of the year looks to be a little bit more virtual, but um, anything that's maybe more like after uh, the last day of July, something to the point where, you know what, um, we're going to be actually, you know, they might be saying, whoever it is, might be saying, we're going to consider making this a virtual meeting, but let's just go ahead and plan as if it's a in-person meeting. Yeah, and so that that seems to be a lot of what's going on. And to be personally, and you you can talk about this, Tom, if you'd like. I I appreciate there always being a virtual option there. However, some places are a little bit better than others when it comes to the voices over the phone actually being heard and the audio quality in the room if there is also an in-person situation. And so I don't mind having virtual meetings. I don't mind having in-person meetings or everything's safe. Sometimes I do mind having those hybrid meetings because you, it appears that some of those meetings that the online people do not have an equal footing as some of the people in the room. You know what, I, that's, a, that's a good point. And we're struggling with this right now for the Western section meeting, the IEI. And I know we were talking about, uh, we were initially, you know, we have a lot of people that like the online experience because, you know, they don't have to leave their home, to your point. And in a lot of cases, because of what we're doing here, I've got two microphones, you've got a microphone, we've got good uh, video, and it's a controlled environment, right? But when you go live and you try to do the hybrid, there's always that, to your point, that disadvantage. So I'm thinking, and we're going to experience, we're going to what do they call that experiment <laughs> with this, this year to see what is the balance and maybe, maybe the, uh, I, I don't know what the answer is, uh, but I, I agree with you that um, it's, you know, you can't replace the, the, the coffee pot talk and all that good stuff. But I think moving forward, you're going to start seeing hybrid situations of some sort that, Technology will tell you where that's going to go as opposed to, and the capabilities, right? So, you know, I, it took today, one year ago today, I went live to tell people about a program I was going to put on live. So I got the notification on Facebook that, hey, one year ago today, this was your post, which was kind of cool. But I realized I was on a learning experience and curve. So that was a challenge for me. And I know our industry is going to be challenged with that as well. Absolutely. So um, we've got 
industry resources we already talked about, and we shared those in links, and we're going to be referencing some of those as we move forward. Today's title is Surviving in Your Own Home. If you don't have anything else on news, David, we're going to get right into it. Let's do it. All right. So Surviving in Your Own Home. Uh, what I did was I pulled, there's a really, the, one of the references down below goes to the Consumer Product Safety Commission, and they put a report out every year. And, and when I looked at the report, they, they do different like time periods. They have like 2000, whatever to two or 19, whatever to 19, whatever. Right. So 2015 to 2017 was the fire report. And there's another one on the electrocutions, which there it is right here. Yeah. The electrocutions uh, report goes from 2004 to 2013. So uh, it's called electrocutions associated with consumer products. So the CPSC is looking specifically when it comes to electric electrocutions at consumer products. And it's an interesting how when you look at, they say estimated 70 consumer product related electrocutions in 2010, 40 in 2011, 40 in 2012, it seems to be pretty consistent. I don't have the 14, 15, 16, and on through today. This is the data that I could easily find. But my thoughts, David, are that in today's home, think about GFCI protection has been in a residential home since 1971 when it started in swimming pools right? We've continued to expand it, yet people are still dying in their home. And if I look at the numbers, the, these are the three common product categories, large appliances, small appliances, and ladders, all right? So large appliances are the big one, small appliances, and, and, and this is your, your top three, so to speak. Now, they talk about consumers, you know, doing work and, uh, you know, during repair work or whatnot. And, and in some cases, when I look at some of the data, you know, they're working on the appliances and things of that nature or working with an appliance that, that fails, right? Like a tool. But I like, I, I find this table interesting out of the CPSC data. And the reason I do is because look, look the way it says in two, Look at the first column says NCHS electrocution records and then CPSC electrocution records. And then it says estimated CPSC in scope records. Okay. What I, what I, what's happening is it's just like any data. If I want to tell you here's, here are where consumer products, appliances cause an electrocution. I have to be sure of that, right? So I have to make sure that I look at, okay, I've got a case where David Smith was electrocuted. What happened to him? Okay, he was, um, we, we're not sure. He was just electrocuted. Well, I can't put that in an appliance because I'm not sure, right? Sure. But if, you, if, you, if I can sit down and say, yeah, you know, he was playing with a toaster in the bathtub again, and boom, he bit the dust. Well, now I know that's an appliance issue. Uh, directly related to a, a misuse of an appliance. Now that would go in scope. So I was just floored at the number of electrocutions outside of just a consumer related. And these are, these are in residential homes. This isn't work related. That's a whole separate database. Right. These are people electrocuted in their residential home. And so I just want to make sure that, that everyone is aware of what we're kind of looking at here. So we already went over what the CPSC is, the Consumer Product Safety Commission. What is that NCHS that you have there, Tom? NCHS. Let me, uh, let me see. Whoop. NCHS. Let me see if I'm I have sorry the... for jumping on you without, a, no, without giving uh, you a little I, bit I, 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 I don't want to say the acronym without being accurate. So it's the National Center for Health Statistics. Gotcha. That's the NCHS. So they have their own record as well. So they, but, but the, the point of what this study is saying is that NCHS records lack product information. Okay, so here we have an organization that's tracking electrocutions. And, and quite frankly, uh, more than, 
I'm not sure of the details on whether or not there's an overlap. Like if the CPSC is counting an electrocution that also NCHS is, there's probably a likelihood of that. So I think if you look at both of these numbers, I wouldn't add them up. I would say they're both probably tracking the same uh, right. statistic, right? There is um, probably some type of Zen diagram, or Ven, Zen, not Zen diagram, but Venn diagram. Zen diagram is a different thing. Uh, from from and also what it looks like is that uh, the the column number two is always a, a little bit bigger than column number three, so it might be just a difference in scope between the same events. I'm not 100% sure. I wonder. I just that might be something we might have to go into um, in a different uh, episode of Eat and Tech Talk Tuesdays at five. Um, yeah, <laughs> the official uh, LLC name of the, <laughs> of the program, right? <laughs> Yeah. So it says the NCHS database contains records of all death certificates filed in the United States. Got it. Okay. Yeah. And then, um, and, and, but the, and the CPSC staff is using that. So it, it would be great. You know what? I, I have some relationships with some, uh, you know, D Doug Lee is on code making panel too. Okay. So uh, this would be a good question. Uh, and I would love to see if we can get Doug Lee on the program. Bring them on. Let's do it. <laughs> yeah, I I yeah. probably and have to get behind this curtain. We actually have <laughs> Doug Lee coming out right now. Just kidding. Just messing around. Anyway. I, I I'd probably <laughs> have to get Biden to sign off on that, but um, but that's okay. You know, I we, we we can we can work it out. We'll figure it out. We'll figure that out. But but so so um so I think first is you have to understand that and um, you know this is what is that table one now table five is the electrocutions uh, reported to CPSC by consumer product. And, and it's a big, long table, so all I did, and I can, I can read off some others if, uh, if we really want to talk about it, but um, you know, if you look at it, uh, the, 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 the big uh, references here, you got household wiring, uh, 21, hand tools, 22, Ladders, 27. Large appliances, 67 total from 2004 to 2013. Lighting equipment, 33. Uh, what else? They got other miscellaneous products. Uh, pole, P-O-L-E. I'm not sure what that. Pools, whirlpools. Power tools, 39. Recreational equipment, 12. Small appliances, 61. Wow. Uh, and, there, and unspecified electrical cords, 17. So... There's a lot of data and you just have to ask yourself, and I know there's a lot of existing homes, okay? I know there's a lot of existing homes, but if you just think about how long we have had GFCI protection in kitchens, how long has it been since we had GFCI protection around swimming pools, around any sink and things of that nature, yet we're still losing people. Now, to that discussion, um, there is a link. There is a link in the uh, in, in this URL to CPSC data, which you can create queries. Okay, and on your own, because remember, CPSC is uh, that data is all is 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 free data because it's paid for by U.S. citizens, right? Because we're right. we're paying for the uh, the organization, all that good stuff. But what was What's interesting is you can go into the data and you can filter and you can query and look for incidents. And when I did this a little bit ago, I went in, I was just doing electrocutions. I was finding a lot of products. Like, for example, there was an arm, a, a, an armchair. A guy died in his armchair. It was one of those power chairs that you plug in and it and like lifts you and stuff like that. He was electrocuted because there was a, it was a, you know, it's a moving object and it's got you know, a mechanism and there was a short sure. and he was electrocuted in his own chair, you know? So you, you look at that and you say, I know today, you know, we have GFCI, our, our, our history shows we always associate GFCI protection with what, 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 uh, what type oh, of, yeah. what? Water. Moisture. Moisture. Absolutely. Exactly. Yeah. But in reality, it, it's, not, it's not just moisture. It's when a product reaches its end of life or if it's misused, right, and it fails, if it's plugged in, 
you're at risk, regardless of what receptacle you put it in, you're at risk of shock due to either misapplication, and put it this way. So David, what electrocutions have ever occurred on purpose outside of, uh, you know, uh, outside of in a prison, okay? <laughs> All right. <laughs> what, what, you know, we don't set out going, Hey, you know what? Um, uh, I'm going to get electrocuted today because I'm going to work with my, uh, this hair dryer and I'm going to, you know, do some crazy things with it. No, we, sure. it's normal use. And, and sometimes we push products to the limit, but that doesn't mean that it's justified to be to succumb to electricity. Yeah, absolutely. And, and one other comment, I guess commentary I did want to provide there is that, you know, considering that particular table was, was it 2004 to 2013? Is that correct? Yeah, it was. Uh, okay. Two, yep. Perfect. Just, and so I, yep. I'm very curious to see now that with the expansion that we have with 210.8A, with it going up for dwelling units up to 250 volts, it, it's interesting to see, you know, of course, that is going to be, you know, we're already almost a year into it now, a little bit longer than that. Mm -hmm. And even we probably have, what, eight or nine states so far that have adopted the 2020 NEC. And all that has really done so far is capture all the new homes from whenever that state adopted it on. And so it's going to take time for these particular changes to really penetrate into the market and to, to properly show in the data of how useful it has been. And we've had these types of conversations all the time with AFCI and GFCI whenever it comes to just the nature of the industry, both the home building industry and the electrical industry in general, it will take time for these particular changes that are great for safety. The reason why they're in there is for safety. It just is, it's not going to happen overnight. Yeah. So we're going to eventually have a bleed into the market. And, you know, as we continue to research and develop different ways to save people's lives, essentially, and, you know, mitigate any type of fire data, um, not <laughs> mitigate fires, not the data, I should say, um, we're just going to eventually see these particular events hopefully go down, but it's just not going to happen overnight as much as we'd all want to. And so, you know, unfortunately, you know, if you actually did go back and get data from 1971, you probably wouldn't see it actually, the numbers actually go down until probably 1980, something like that. And so eventually, you know, yes, I appreciate you not stabbing anymore. <laughs> I it was, know. It was getting, it's, <laughs> Ryan was yeah. like, you're stabbing him in the face. <laughs> wait, wait, and Santiago says another consideration is that people should get explan explanation related to how to one experience I had on the IEEE conference was problems on the management on Zoom. It happens and can happen. Yep. Sure. So that's going back to the, the situation of, you know, whether in person or full virtual uh, or hybrid. Yeah. This is what you know, it was Santiago was saying. And thank you very much, Santiago, for for, uh, for mentioning that. And in, I'm particularly um, sensitive to that just because it is very much significantly part of my role at Eden. And so... Uh, you know, me being, you know, we're just grounded for right now, which is great. And I completely understand that. It just makes it tough whenever um, it's a hybrid. And so, you know, maybe my hearing or my recollection of a particular meeting um, might not be fully understood because I just couldn't understand what they were saying. Or if I was trying to make an argument about how, you know, X, Y, and Z could lead to less deaths in New Hampshire than uh, the New Hampshireans. Residents of New Hampshire, whoever is representing New Hampshire, <laughs> might not be able to hear me because of whatever audio quality that might have in there. Now, that is particular to me. That is personal. But it's not just me. I can assure you of that. Um, we've seen several viral videos recently. Of a th I don't know if you saw this. This was a particular lawyer who was uh, about to uh, you know, do some type of deposition or a case or something. And he had a filter on. It was a cat. Oh, and I saw that. Th yeah. So... There's always going to be different levels of tech uh, literacy, I guess I should say. But, uh, but yes. luckily, I'm not a cat. We have not had that so far. I'm sure Tom and his rig could, could probably figure it out a way for me to be a cat. And, and I appreciate you... I'm I'm just in a T-shirt right now. He's done amazing <laughs> technological things to make it appear as if I'm looking formal. It's, <laughs> it's not really David Smith. It's really somebody else. That's right. Yes, yes. I love and it. Here in a couple of days, we'll probably have the hologram of me just on the wall or something, so everybody can can do that 3D. It's going to be great. I love it. <laughs> so, so let's talk about indicators. So you're in your residential home, 
And, and, and let's talk about existing homes. Some yes. of the indicators that would, that, you know, I, I move into my house, I'm all happy. I'm, 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 uh, I'm, I'm installing my pictures, frames, I'm putting in my furniture, all this great stuff. And what would alert me? I mean, I, for my HVAC system, I have a contract. The guy comes in in the spring and the fall and he maintains my HVAC because you know what? When it fails, I get cold or I get warm and that's ungood, right? Right. What about electrical? I don't have a contract with my electrician to come back to my house. What are some of the reasons why I might see there's a, there's a problem in my home? You know what? Before we actually go into it, that actually does bring up a good point that I didn't even consider. I just recently bought a home. And it is a uh, home that was built in 1960. I did not build the home, but um, but it came with a one year home warranty. And so um, it, I wonder if I would have to check my particular uh, policy or whatever. Now, of course, I, I would assume it depends on whatever policy provider as a, that I would have it or anybody else has. But I wonder if particular electrical situations would fall under um, the provisions of the insurance policy, uh-huh. and if a contractor or if a truck would be need to be rolled out um, to be able to contact that, because because my understanding is that if that was to happen, then I would have to or anybody else, whoever, let's say me, for example, if my HVAC died or if I uh, found to uh, I have faulty wiring in my house, which would be very embarrassing because I work for Eaton, but um, I I believe that the insurance policy. Uh, providers, I suppose I should say, have certified contractors that they normally pre-approve beforehand. And like, uh, it, it, I, no. I believe that's the case. And Tom, so, you might be able to speak a little bit more about that. Well, I'll tell you what. So I had a problem in my house here. Um, when I first moved down to St. Louis, I have a, this is embarrassing, but I have a geothermal system. Okay. And I thought, because I'm not, I'm not a mechanical guy, I don't know anything about the geothermal system, the way the piping and everything, I figured, well, I have to have my water on. So I left it on. So I go down to St. Louis, and it goes below freezing up here in Pennsylvania, or in we're in West Virginia, and my pipes froze, okay? West Virginia represent. <laughs> <laughs> my, my pipes froze, and I had 40, about 48,000 gallons of water come down through the house, Okay. So, so we found out, we got it, you know, I called uh, Serve Pro, and when Serve Pro says this is too big of a project for us, right. <laughs> that means that shows you got a problem, right? So we brought in this uh, group, Duckstein, and um, for the electrical, they had a group now. So Duckstein was the general contractor. So they had, and they're approved by, uh, by State Farm. So State Farm's my insurance company. So right. I guess through that, uh, they, they, they probably, uh, I don't think they're approving the electrician, but they're approving the general, the GC on right. that. Right. So um, now he came in and now the, insur- so when we were going through the house, the um, my, my contractor said, you know, state farm's probably going to push back because the water came right down through the panel board. Okay. I hired my own. I called the local down here over in Steubenville uh, they were very kind. They brought a contractor over, a couple electricians, and they they were taking the the breakers out and dumping the water out. Right, so we put temporary oh. breakers in. They were drying out the uh, app, like the the installation, just to get you know t- to get us back up and running. So they they made it all safe. So are you um, telling me, Tom, you couldn't recondition that equipment? No, no, that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's another conversation. That's a whole nother uh, two hour <laughs> session, right? On reconditioning of equipment. But uh, so they, so they made it safe. They got it back up and running again. But that's when I decided to put GFCI protection for the entire home because now, and State Farm did, uh, did replace the panel board and my sub panel that was over there. They replaced my hot water tank, two hot water tanks, which are electric. And they replaced, um, uh, they paid for replacement of some components on my HVAC system. Uh, and, and I can't say, I, I tell you what, I, I became a, uh, you know, everybody loves their insurance company when they, when it works out and thank God it worked out and, and uh, State Farm did a great job and they were very accommodating uh, throughout the whole situation. But when it come to, co- when it comes to contractors, it was really the GC who got the approval and he hired 
the electrician, all the other trades associated right. with that. Gotcha. Okay. Well, good yeah. to know. Yeah, it's good to um, know. Good, good stuff. I was about to say, uh, so you're telling me that your uh, insurance policy uh, made it so that you didn't have to, to bite the entire bullet on the bill and you didn't have to take a bath? I did not have to take a bath. I did have a deductible. But here's, the, here's another important thing. Oh, yeah. So here's another important thing. When we left, so the insurance agency, the insurance agent called me and she says, I have three questions for you. And depending upon the answer of those three questions will depend upon whether or not you're covered. I just imagine this is like Monty Python. Like they just, uh, <laughs> oh, man. I'm telling you what, I, I felt like it was on, uh, I, I felt like I was on a TV program, right? Okay. And you know, it's like, you've got three, three chances. So um, the first question she asked me was what temperature did I have my thermostat on when I left the house? And I remember having this discussion with my wife and I told her this story and I said, look, I said, I, rem I know exactly what my temperature was because when I left, I wanted to put it on 60 or 58 or something like that. And my wife said, no, put it on 70. So I compromised and we put it on 70. Okay. <laughs> so, so so she says, and, and she goes, well, that was a good answer because if you would have done the former, yeah. we probably would have not covered this because they have some minimum requirements on your, you have to, you have to establish a yeah. temperature setting. And, and so, and I don't know if she was saying that because- And the minimum requirement is listening to your wife. I, I don't know. And, and that's wife. what I'm saying. I don't know if she was saying it because you're lucky you listened to your wife because if you didn't, but but I, right. I think there probably is a a set point that they require. I mean, if I put it down around 40 degrees or something like that, I mean, if for a long term, like if you're going to be away from your home for a long term, it probably matters on what temperature you put it on, right? right. So in any case, um, the second question was uh, was related to why I was gone, Okay. So it was like, is this house your second home? Is this one that, you know, uh, what, is this your primary residence? You know, and I was only down there because we were in transition. So that was my second. And the third question was why? Was it a maintenance failure? Did I, did I not, you know, did I pull maintenance? And so those are all other considerations. And uh, it was a frozen pipe and I had to get a plumber. And I was crossing my fingers when the plumber was there. I'm like, oh man, come on, please say it was a frozen pipe. And, and it was, it was compression fittings. So. There you go. Yeah. But, but when, you know, so that was an indicator for me that I have an, I could have electrical issues, right? Because I had a major event, my electrical equipment received water. I was concerned about the conductor. So I called Dave Mercier from Southwire and I talked to David. David ta taught me about wicking, about submersed conductors, as opposed to conductors where you have water just flow over top of the insulation. Okay. I was concerned about the lighting. Uh, State Farm was like, you know, we're not going to replace the lighting. So, and that was what helped me was the uh, putting GFCI protection. My electrician wasn't happy um, because we were finding problems, right? And uh, I was happy because I was getting my problems fixed. So um, we were, uh, we had some tripping items and whatnot. So we were finding issues with some can lights and some other areas where, I'm not sure if it was the actual water damage or if it was probably miswired to begin with. I'm not sure. You know, it's hard to say. Interesting. Well, that is uh, that is highly educational, both for I mean, for, for probably everyone else there. But I'm I'm learning a lot. Um, I it, it's the home experience is certainly something I've been enjoying, and both enjoying literally enjoying sarcastically. I can say I can yeah. say that right now. Home ownership so. has its benefits, but it also has its challenges. That's right. Now let's find out some of those challenges. Perfect. Okay. Lights that flicker on and off or that simply dim whenever they shouldn't dim. Um, this is one of those situations, essentially, this is a very good example right now. Uh, my girlfriend right now lives in a student housing apartment. She's in grad school. And whenever I go over there uh, in her restroom, the, the light switch is essentially both a light switch for the paddle and there's also another paddle that's a fan. And so sometimes that fan works. Whenever I turn it on, sometimes it does not. Whenever I turn on a light, sometimes they flicker. Sometimes they don't turn on at all. And so these are particular situations where I'm, if I lived in that house, um, I would essentially say, 
we got to figure out what's going on here yeah. because it is a very much an existing building. Um, you know, it is it has been weathered. It's, it's a veteran building, right? So, uh, so there's several things that could be wrong, particularly here. It could be the light switch itself. It could be a faulty switch. There could be something wrong with the light fixture itself, particularly because she has a um, light that's also a fan. It is one particular fixture. There could be something going on with that particular fixture. And also anything in between, right? There could be any type of loose or damaged wire between yeah. the switch or the fixture or simply going back to the panel for the branch circuit itself. There are several different things that could be happening. The particular switch itself could be loose in the wall. Um, in the contacts itself, not only is the, the, um, the wiring could be possibly loose, but also just the switch being, you know, not tightly tightened to the wall could be a simple sign of there could be something going on. And that, because if the switch is not fastened properly, that could eventually damage the wiring anyway. Yeah. So uh, there are several different things. I know I just threw out maybe three or four different scenarios that could be wrong here that could all potentially cause fires or do ignitions. Or I know, I'm not sure if we're going to get the glowing contacts in, here. In oh, yeah, bit, we are. But good, because, you know, all of these different scenarios, and of course, you know, this is a, Flickering and dimming lights, flickering lights and dimming lights that shouldn't dim, I guess I should say. Um, these are, for the most part, elementary, you know, particularly for people that are probably going to be on this particular call. But it's always nice to just go through the diagnosis of possibly what's going on, because, you know, if you went through all five or six different things and there are actually seven of them and you missed that one, then, you know, it, it, that could be just as likely to cause any type of event than any of the others. Yeah. So the, I'm not sure if I touched on all of them, Tom, you can go ahead and go ahead and yeah. freestyle and yeah, I, let you me know, know what you think. I, I agree with everything that you said there. And I, and I've had in, in, you know, I've had some, ex I tell you what, I don't know. I've had, I've got this black cloud over me cause I can give you examples uh, on all of the stuff that we're going to talk about today. Uh, I've had uh, where my, my dimmer switch was not compatible with my light. Okay. So I went and I put, uh, I think it was, I think it was fluorescent tubes, uh, those fluorescent bulbs I put in my basement uh, at my previous house. Sure. And I put one of those occupancy sensor switches. So when you walk in, it turns the lights on. And when I did that, I mean, it was like, I felt like I was in a disco, baby. You know, <laughs> I told my wife, Bobby Joe was like, what's going on? I said, this is, this is dancing material. You know, I said, but it was, uh, but, but at, when I read, you know, this is, <laughs> This is the important thing when, when read the instructions. Okay. So I'm guilty. I'm guilty. I had to go dumpster diving and I read the instructions on that switch and the compatibility. And it told me what lights it was meant for and what it wasn't. So that is uh, an important thing uh, to, to always remember um, uh, that re regarding the, um, the whole, the whole safety aspect or the whole compatibility aspect. And sure. that's what, this is the, one of the benefits of hiring a professional, okay? Hiring somebody who knows what he's doing with regard to a lot of these products. Now, now you could say, Tom, you made that switch and you should have known, but, and, and I probably should have hired somebody. Um, it, but, you know, I, it, 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 it's one of those things where there are certain tasks that homeowners should can and shouldn't do. And in some cases, it's you're better off hiring, especially if you're dealing with lights that are flickering or dimming, you're not gonna troubleshoot this stuff on your own. You're not gonna start taking receptacles out and seeing if the connections are there or doing anything on that circuit. You've got an issue, you're gonna hire, or you're gonna call somebody, you're gonna get somebody in to take, take a look at it, who's licensed and all this other good stuff, regardless of- sure the city or state that you're in. I actually, you know, I'm going to actually riff a little bit now that you, you kind of jogged a little bit of some of my memories of my past life being a consulting engineer. We had um, a job. It was for the local university music hall. And so it was this, the, the recording studio for the local university. They were, you know, they had all of their, you know, choirs and bands and everything. And it's where, you know, it was a soundproof room. And mm -hmm. so the lights, well, everything had to be largely, you know, I don't want to say soundproof, but as least sound as possible. 
Yep. And we, it turned out that we had spec'd a particular kind of fixture. Um, and my PE that I was working under at the time had the foresight. Very, very smart guy. Because the, considering the application, he made sure that the LEDs that he was picking did not have any type of particular yep. humming that, um, that some other models might have. And so yeah. even if the LED is working or not working, some faulty LEDs, they might have something going on in their controller and then might, that might produce some type of a humming sound. And also, we have also found that if there is a particular faulty LED controller, um, you know, that could possibly, well, I, some people, the person that actually was telling me about this, they said it could look like tripping. I would argue that it might be actually tripping. And by, what I mean by that is arcing. He said there could it could look like yeah. arcing if it's a faulty LED fixture. I said it might actually be arcing. It's not. Yeah. It could just not just look like that. It might actually be arcing inside the LED controller, sure. and so that might be the reason why it's actually faulty. And so just to kind of go back to my particular story, you know, I, the contractor that we were working with, luckily in our particular spec sheets, we said you know. You could do an equivalent, just like every other spec sheet, you know, whenever you're building out bill of materials, the um, consulting engineer goes and per picks out a particular uh, model, make a model on the product number, everything like that, whatever you need for the entirety of everything. And normally there's some type of, you know, fine print that says this or some type of equivalent. And our particular firm um, did not have to go and buy new lights for the end model because that was not considered a equivalent because it did not match up the speculative standards, spec, yeah. like spec standards of the decibel levels for that particular LED. So a lot of that going on there, but I did want to throw in the fact that, you know, just kind of roll back what we were talking about. Faulty anything is a, absolutely a situation, right? Faulty yep. essentially means it could very well easily be a fire hazard for any type of application that you're talking about. And LEDs are not outside of that. Um, the electrical industry is essentially, I would say, I mean, it is boilerplate now that most of yeah. your lights, if not all of your lights are now going to be LED, which, you know, great whenever it comes to uh, being cost effective, for the most part, they've gotten a lot better in the past 10 years for sure. Yeah. Um, but and great for whatever comes to the energy code. However, nothing is perfect. And there's always going to be some problems and there's all you need to look out for some of the possible causes of any type of safety hazard and LEDs are not outside of that. And so I'm glad to be able to at least mention the fact that controllers can go bad in LEDs because going bad could mean some type of fire hazard. One other point I did want to mention, uh, Ian Romeo, one of our uh, product line guys for Eaton Lighting, or well, for Eaton Wiring Devices, I should say, uh, did want to mention the fact that uh, you mentioned occupancy sensors but also something that is very useful is vacancy sensors. And I always have to oh. keep the one of the two in, in mind. And I'm sure he's going to send me a text of exactly which ones, which I'm 90% sure occupancy hazard, occupancy sensors, sense if anyone's inside and vacancy hazard, vacancy sensors, pardon me, sense if anyone's not there anymore. Wow. So one turns the lights on whenever someone actually enters and one turns the lights off whenever someone there's not anyone there and there's a timer. I believe I have that right. And I'm sure cool. he's going to let me know here in a little bit, but uh, yeah, yeah, just letting everybody know. Um, do you want to now talk about whenever appliances kick on and there's dimming? You want well, to talk about that before we move yeah, on? Yeah. So you have the appliances kicking on, which could cause right. dimming. It could right. also, like you said about the LED lighting and whatnot, uh, HID, like if you have HID, you've got to have the right overcurrent protective device, right? HID lighting is going to require uh, a circuit breaker that's listed for that application. Uh, fluorescence, we have breakers that are listed for the use with fluorescence because of that inrush current. I've heard issues with, with regard to LED lighting as well because of the inru inrush on those drivers. If you put too many drivers on a circuit, you could run into the instantaneous pickup of your circuit breaker. So uh, you know, that inrush and that starting can cause various issues. One, you could trip your overcurrent protective device because of the inrush. And we talk about that from an overcurrent protective perspective, but also the whole aspect of that, that inrush of current, whatever you're starting could, to your point, cause some dimming, right? Sure. Absolutely. And it, it completely depends on, you know, how big that particular uh, load is, whether that's actually yeah. kicking on. 
Um, you know, I would imagine there's probably some situation where there might be some imbalance on your panel um, that could possibly cause that kind of thing. Um, and I'm also kind of curious, I've heard of this and I'm waiting for Patrick Walsh to come onto this particular show. I have heard that if you have an SPD, it tends to clean up those particular situations that actually might end up one of the side effects or benefits, I guess I should say, of having an SPD is that it, you might actually see less situations when your lights you know, dim whenever something kicks on and off. Wow. And I'm curious to see when he's actually going to you know, come on the show uh, to explain to us exactly how that phenomenon occurs. I'd love to have that discussion. I mean, I, that would be news. To, I've not heard of a surge device helping with sags. I mean, I've heard, right. you know, because surge clips off and it shunts and whatnot. So, and, and I'd love to have that discussion. So hopefully in one of our future episodes, we could uh, explore surge products. See, that's a professional tease, Tom. That's what the, how they do it in the, Is that in what... the business. That's how the professionals do it. So, uh, you know, just kind of trying to class up the place. <laughs> you know, they've always said you have a face for radio. Now I know what they that's mean. That's true. That's yeah. exactly right. <laughs> awesome. Was it the the south end of a north facing horse or something like that? Is <laughs> That's right. right. That's right. <laughs> you know, here's another one. So we talk about tripping, right? So we put AFCIs on a home that was built in the 50s. And we had a couple circuits tripping. This was one of them. This was a picture. This was on an outside wall. And you could see that this uh you could just barely see the the brick back here in the uh in the back of the um uh, like through the back of the box. It's a metal box. You can see rust on that box. You could tell the age of the wiring because it's that, uh, it, it, the insulation was so brittle when, when we removed, uh, I forget it was Bruce Terhorse was the electrician. He removed the receptacle and I could not believe that the insulation just, there was no insulation on a couple of these, uh, wires and and what the ones that did had did have insulation, like you can just barely see it on that one wire that's coming out to the to the pop top right in the back there. The insulation he moved it, and the insulation just fell off. Um, and it was, and I think that's just because of the the location of where that circuit was run. We ended up the AFCI was a branch feeder at the time, which had ground fault protection of equipment. So we had a lot of we had leakage current going all over the place in this house. Uh, so we had to pull a new circuit for this specific installation. And I have another picture coming up after this next one uh, of, uh, of another example of a, uh, a wiring issue that we caught with an AFCI was, again, our, our branch circuit AFCIs came with 30 milliamp ground fault protection of equipment. So a lot of problems uh, that I've seen historically in AFCI world of tripping had to do with leakage currents. Uh, and, and it was problems like this. In fact, this one was out of South Carolina. Mm -hmm. And I remember when, and I have a whole video series on this because the story on this one is just compelling. Not Bill Crosby. Cosby, thanks for showing up. And, and what up? Uh, glad you're here. So uh, and we got Santiago, always say much, uh, and, and we, uh, Santiago, thanks for chatting it up, buddy. So this one here was, um, was, was interesting because the homeowner contacted us. He sent a letter to me thanking Eaton for saving his family's life. And, and when you get a letter like that, I, so I called him and I asked him to tell me the story and he, and he, he was just, it was a very cool story because you had a homeowner who had tripping issues going on, wasn't sure what was going on. He called multiple electricians. Finally, they found the problem between the breaker in the basement and the bedroom circuit. And it was because, and, and you know, the, the, the electrician didn't, uh, the electrician didn't, didn't do this on purpose. Uh, he probably didn't see the gusset plate, drilled through it, and I'm sure he ruined a bit on that one. I mean, look at the, he boogered up that gusset plate, right? And then, sure. he, then he pulls the conductors down to the panel board and it, it shredded the wires uh, down, going down to the panel board. The inspector missed it, the electrician missed it, but the technology is unforgiving and it found this issue. And I tell you what, he was so um, appreciative because in his journey, 
to find out what was wrong because he was selling his house. He didn't want to replace it with a standard breaker. Thank God he didn't because where this arcing was, there was a gas leak in his in his attic. The, there were two gas leaks up there. The electrician is, uh, we have a video of him. We interviewed him and he was willing to go on, on record because even to him, it was like one of those moments where you go, what I'm doing is making a difference. The homeowner said, what you make and this installation is making a difference because in his mind, he saved his family's life and no one will know if that would have resulted in an electrical fire, an explosion possibly, and loss of life. We'll never know, thank God, if that would have happened. But the recipe was there. Two gas leaks in the, in the attic near where the arcing and sparking was going, uh, a faulty conductor and faulty wire that was de- that was detected by the AFCI technology. Uh, it's just uh, those types of stories don't get told enough, in my opinion. You're absolutely right. And just kind of, you know, echo what you were just kind of talking about there. You rightly say that we'll never really know if um, if that would have happened, but I think we have a pretty good idea considering there are multiple gas leaks in that house and that was already arcing and the device is doing its job. We, I mean, the recipe was there, right? It does. Mm-hmm. It's not too much of a stretch to have that be an absolute advocacy story for AFCI technology. And, you know, one of the things you should do having AFCI and GFCI in your house, um, just to pick up on not malicious situations, but just in, it could be absolutely a licensed person that it, it, they might not necessarily even be making a huge mistake, but, you know, I, I mean, how many times we talk about improper wiring when it comes to GFCI, you know, yeah. it could be an absolute 100% licensed person that's done it for 40 years. And, you know, at the, Whenever it comes to proper wiring, it's probably less so. But for a particular situation like this, um, you know, this is always a good safety net just to make sure. Yep. And it's one of those one-time insurance policies, right? Like you're not re-upping this insurance policy every year. Whenever it comes right. to AFCI, GFCI, it's a one-time payment. You don't have to worry about it anymore. Um, and you never know when it's actually going to pay off. Jeez, I mean. Yeah. What, that that particular individual had what wife and two daughters is that right yeah yeah i mean yeah think about how many you know if you had to ask him about a nominal value for you know picking Priceless. afci right that absolutely you don't that's not a math equation that anybody is going to really make that is exactly right and that and that's what it gives you that really helps i, I know when people ask me what do i do i say i save lives because we work on educating we work on code changes. We work on products that bring these values and find problems. Here's another one. This was, again, you know, you, the other thing you got to think about, you have multiple trades coming into a residential home. It's not just the electrical guy, right? You've got, you've got the plumber, you've got the, um, and I've got pictures of, 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 you know, HVAC wiring was in before HVAC during construction and then the HVAC guy gets there and says, I got to put duct work behind these wires. And what does he do? He pulls on the wires and you can end up uh, hurting your insulation like this, either from pulling it or, you know, driving nails in from say framing or uh, maybe putting siding on this one. This was again, that same house that we were talking about. Look what they did here. They, now they, they tied the neutral to the to the they went around the ground and you know what they the other side of that wire was tied into the um the ears I call them on the receptacle and and they, that's that's how they were grounding the system and their their return path it was it was just a, it was a mess and and the the GFC, the AFCI was tripping but you know and and we started to isolate the problems and thank God I had a good electrician who were with us that uh, that found these issues and said hey. I, we found shared neutrals when they didn't have to share neutrals. We found problems like this. So uh, there's a, there's a, a, the AFCISafety.org, one of the links down below, there is a uh, case study or a found problems uh, uh, material that is a great reference to, to help provide information on, uh, on the proper, uh, on, on what AFCIs are actually doing in the industry. Cool. Appliance failures. 
right? End of life. We've got code changes around uh, these types of things with dryers. And uh, I took this photo. Uh, this was down actually at, um, this photo was, Georgia Power has a nice cool uh, uh, place where they talk about electric appliances and stuff like that. And I was in, it's almost like an, exp like we have the experience center. Georgia Power has a similar installation. I, I took a couple pictures there. This was uh, from that facility, a really great ex facility that, uh, the general public can go take a look at. Um, but, um, you know, these things, these types of big metal boxes with water and shake don't last forever, right? You take a look at, at these big metal boxes outside. They have fans and there's, th I, know, I know they're built for that environment, but problems can happen in all of these installations and they're electrified. They're in a wet area. They're in an outside area. When a problem occurs, if a problem occurs, we can take steps to provide protection. You know, what I was just amazed when I went to visit this installation, this is a residential dwelling unit. One, two, three, four, five, six, and one little itty bitty one. For that, for that one house, that was just Is that phenomenal. to keep your computer cool, Tom? I think that's I'm what telling you, right David. <laughs> I mean, that is the house that I, that I want to live in. And copper drain pipes. I just was totally impressed with this that's one. That's something else. I, I would like to live in that house. I do not want to pay the mortgage payment for it. No, nor the electric bill. No. <laughs> so I, I, I'd come and visit. So whoever owns that house, if you can... Um, so here's another good one before we get done here. Heat, where heat shouldn't be. Right. So this is the glowing contact. Now, you know, in, in my role, I get a lot of people sending me stuff, okay? Receptacles that have burned up, uh, breakers that have burned up, panel boards that have burned up, wires that were burned up, um, all kinds of lighting. I had somebody send me two lighting fixtures at one point that were, that were, uh, uh, that were burned and, and whatnot. This one came from an employee here at Eaton. And I, 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 I should have grabbed the, it's back in my bookcase here. He wrote a little letter with it. He mailed this to me and, and he was moving with, uh, with Eaton. And what are you laughing about? <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. You laughing at my okay. bookcase? Yeah, it's it good. It's behind the grandfather clock. Okay, I understand. Okay, and I got to move the grandfather clock to get to it. Right. It's just yep. like you, you grab the latch. Like you, you grab one of the pendulums and the whole thing just like... It just moves. It's like a Scooby-Doo situation. And I have to say the magic words like open sesame. Right, right, right. Well, don't do that. And then it'll... Oh! You just yeah, see it. No, no, no. You got to pull the lever too. Jeez. But, but What are we doing here? Okay, sorry. So, so, so this, this uh, Eaton uh, sales individual sends me this and his letter says he was moving from one location to another. He pulls the refrigerator out. This was in his garage. This was not me, by the way. For no, it's, asking, it's not David not Smith, not David A. I, you know, and his name is on this letter. That's why, uh, but in any case, maybe uh, I'll figure it out. So he says he pulled the refrigerator away from the wall and, it w and he tried to pull the plug out, but he couldn't because the plug and the receptacle had become one. They melted together. They got married? They got married. So, so that was a, I, and, and in fact, I think somehow I got the, uh, I got the plug off of here, but uh, the plug was on it when I got it. And cause he just cut it off and he was like, wow. Right. And this is what they call yeah. a glowing contact. Right now I got another one, this next little video, hopefully it plays was sent to me by electric electrician. Who, yeah, so uh, I'm not sure, just very quickly, can yeah, you explain ahead. a little bit to anybody what, like, what exactly we're talking about whenever we're talking about glowing contacts? Yeah. You want to take it or you want me to do it? Well, so it's my understanding, you know, this is, this is a little bit, uh, you know, this is me like kind of spitballing here. My understanding is a glowing contact is whenever you have essentially it is a Contact is a connection of two particular conductors that is not tight enough, or is you know it's not meeting the torquing requirements. There we go. See, yep. speaking like a code guy here, um, to where there's some type of 
looseness whenever it comes to connection and it actually creates heat and thus actually melts conductor, uh, fusing them together and making them married as we see right here. Yes, absolutely. And I'm going to just, I'm going to peruse this to see if I can find it, but I had a good video of a glowing contact that um, we captured in a lab. Um, but you're right that, and, and where you'll see this is like, if you don't torque things down enough, you'll get it to where the AFCI won't detect it. A GFCI won't detect it. Okay. It'll just sit there and fester and start to generate heat now, what we found is that eventually, if it, it was on a GFCI or an AFCI protected circuit, eventually that technology will detect it and take it offline. Right. Um, but you know, you don't know what kind of damage it'll do in the process of uh, it getting to that point to where it was enough that an AFCI um, actually uh, was able to detect it. Sure. <clears throat> so I was just looking. I'm. I could swear it might be it might be on a different computer. I'm not seeing well, it. Well, you on... know, as you're looking for that, I will say yeah. just a moment of brevity. I've always thought the gro the glowing contacts would be a great band name. So if you want to start some type of band that in which I could be a part of, the glowing contacts I feel like would be very good. You know uh, for what? NEC based band. I, I I like I like it because no one could touch you. That's right. Exactly. I and like the way you think. It's like the reconditioning. Or something like that. I'm just cracking myself up. If you're, I don't know if I'm yeah. entertaining anybody else, but as long as I'm having a good time, that's all that counts. Know. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. I'm I, paid I can't find people. that video, but uh, ah, I did I what know. I could to, to kill the time. Yeah, team player. Now, now this one here was uh, <laughs> this one here was sent to me uh, by an electrician who found this. Uh, this is a staple. Now you look at it and say. This, uh, this staple doesn't look bad, right? But he's going to turn the lights off. Okay. And, and when he does, now he's telling the guy, turn the light off. Look at that. That's they, not supposed to do that. They I heard do not think this. that's supposed to do that. Yeah. It's not supposed to do this, right? So they heard this. They weren't sure where it was. They, they exposed the conductor, and they were able to identify this is a... Uh, basically, the, the staple was put in. I'm not sure if it was pulled and it punctured, if it was driven in too hard or what it was, but this was not tripping the circuit breaker. It was definitely generating heat, and something like this could fester for a long time, uh, and eventually what happens is it heats that, that, that frame matter of that, that stud, and then it... Uh, it what I, I've had someone who... Who gets, who got into the whole aspect of um, fi fires, and he explained to me that what happens whenever you have like this this type of a a problem, right? You're drying the wood out. You may not ignite it right away, and let's say that's behind the wall where you don't have oxygen. What you're doing is you're generating heat. You're driving the moisture out and you're creating the right recipe such that the moment you, that that heat it is, uh, gets to a point where it does, say, break a barrier where now it gets the oxygen, that all of that wood has been conditioned over a probably a long period of time to a point that the moment it gets oxygen, it becomes an inferno. Right. Okay. And and there was a, in there was a video that was done uh, a long time ago when um, when we were first getting into the AFCI world, where I forget what his name is. He had a home that started on fire in the attic. And you should have seen the joist where the, the wire went through. There was a gap, I'd say a good foot on either side of where that wire was. That basically was, was what this, this issue was festering for a long period of time. And then it went up and it was his neighbor outside who saw the fire and told him, get out of the house because it was going on in the attic. And he had no clue Jeez. that there was a fire going on in, in his attic. 
That's worse than what is it? The neighbor, the strange stranger calls or something like that. Whenever someone's inside your house and you get calling you, that's worse. Those hey. are nightmare movies. See, now I'm going to have nightmares now. I'm, I'm not going to be able to sleep tonight. Thanks to you. Ryan Jackson. He says uh, he was inspecting in 2002 when AFCIs became mandatory electricians changing, changed their stapling. Pr- so that's another good point, Ryan. Good. Yeah. We, if you think about when you have an unforgiving technology like this, GFCIs too. What, what did G, GFCIs drove standard changes? It drove wiring practice changes. What did we used to do before GFCIs in a residential home, especially in the Nomin 2 days? We took knob and tube. They grabbed neutrals wherever they could. They, they weren't particular, right? You just grab a neutral here, grab a neutral there. It all goes back to this. It's like, it's, like, it's like Thanksgiving dinner. You just throw it all on there. It's all going in the same place, right? Just throw it all and mix it all together. Get the gravy in there and all that good stuff and just, just go to town. Well, the, the, the same thing from an electrical perspective. Those guys were like, hey, I need a ground. Take it up over there. I need a neutral. Take it over there. But then GFCIs came in and said, hey, you can't share neutrals like that. You got to, the electrons that go out on this wire got to come back on that wire. That changed wiring behavior in from, from an introduction from a GFCI perspective. AFCIs, to Ryan's point, changed the behavior of, of our industry. And now what we're seeing, and you know this, David, because we're on task groups, it's changing product standards. We're That's looking right. at appliance standards. We're looking at, at other solutions from a compatibility perspective. FCC regulations, right? You've got the whole aspect of, uh, are, is, your, is this product following the FCC rules from emissions and, and, and is it behaving itself on the system? Because compatibilism, look at the, look at the dimmer, the, the uh, um, what do you call it? Uh, the sensors, the, uh, the, 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 the sensors that you would see in a, um, in a residential home, like uh, occupancy sensors. Sure. Some of those occupancy sensors leveraged what you would call, um, what do you call that? Um, um, uh, the, the, they leveraged the equipment grounding conductor because there was no neutral pulled. So you have, a, you have a basically a hot and an equipment grounding conductor coming down to a light switch. You replace that with, uh, what do you call, um, you replace that with an occupancy sensor that needs a hot, a neutral, and the equipment grounding conductor. Well, you don't have the neutral, so what do they do? They put that leakage current over the, over the equipment grounding conductor, which violates the National Electrical Code. Right. So then we changed the code that said, hey, you need to pull a neutral down to that so that you can uh, leverage that in the right manner and that right. changed how we how we wire things so uh, all of these all of these aspects uh, are are you know these the, the technology is changing how we wire and how we uh, make products how we construct products um how we uh, install products there are a lot of things that we do today differently because of technology. Sure. And there's absolutely something to be said about, you know, the push and the pull of how code changes get made. Um, whether it is some type of new technology that, you know, just let's just take AFCI, for example. AFCIs didn't necessarily come about because, hey, some company just came up with it and, you know, we, we got this new thing and now right. we're going to try to put it in the kit. It came from the Consumer Product Safety Commission asking the industry to develop some type of technology that would mitigate fires. And then the industry answered that call and then it started going out into the code. And, and I'll, so, tell you, I'll tell you, I'll tell you to that point, David, there was an individual and I can't remember the organization's name. What they were looking at were the number of fires that were going on. And I, I want to say it was AI it was, I can't remember the name, the acronym of the organization, but there was an individual who was going around cutting wire. And what he was saying was, the thermomagnetic breaker is not doing its job. And he says, it's a faulty product. And then the breaker guys were saying, wait a second, oh, hold on. What you're doing is, it is not intended by this product to provide that protection. It's not tested and listed to detect what you're showing it. Right. Okay. So, so I would say what happened with AFCIs is it was born 
out of a product group defending itself, saying, look, a thermomagnetic breaker is not designed to detect arcing and sparking. And it was uh, Dr. Engel um, who, who came up with that technology with a team of engineers. At, it was, I think, Westinghouse at the time. Uh, and you had a couple, uh, a lot of different people were working on it. Um, and I, I believe our technology was born out of Wisconsin, out of our innovation center, working with uh, Joe Engel and his group. Uh, and I, you know, and that's and that's in my lifetime. You know, it's 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 interesting how we're 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 moving and progressing that uh, that technology forward. And and it was we the we could have looked at it as as a as is just saying, look, no, that's not what we're supposed to do. Go away, leave me alone. But no, they recognized that although the thermomagnetic breaker is not supposed to detect that, it is a problem. Sure. And that guy, that got guys like Joe Engel and Jim Legree uh, at Westinghouse and, and that team of, uh, of engineers looking at it. And they said, we can come up with a way to detect that. Because at the time, we were putting electronics into breakers. We were putting electronics got smaller and smaller and smaller. We had that, that team, Dr. Engel and, Joe, and, um, and, and Jim Legree and crew, those guys were working on those electronic trip units. And when they were presented with this, watching this guy on video cutting wire, they were like, well, let's take a look at that. We did it in our labs and said, well, I can see the signature. I have a microprocessor. We can put that into a small miniature thermomagnetic breaker and we can detect that. And to sure. your point, CPSC brought data. And they said, hey, this is a problem that needs to be addressed. Uh, I, I would say, I would argue that they were, they too were probably looking at the thermomagnetic circuit breaker saying, hey, as a manufacturer, you're not providing that protection. So then yep. boom, we, we got a whole new technology that hit the street. It sounds very similar to at least the, my understanding of how the emergency disconnect came about with, you know, yeah. meters are not graded or properly functioned to having them just be pulled out or axed by a firefighter, you know, like that is a almost uniform action for any type of fire that's going on for a one or two family home from, you know, Florida to Maine, right? Portland to Portland, as I would, I'd like to say. And yeah. so, um, you know, that is essentially how the emergency disconnect came about, whereas the, I think it was the IFFF, um, the Firefighters Association essentially said, hey, you know, we need something on the outside of homes to make it so that we aren't pulling meters and possibly causing our faults. And we don't have to go into these particular burning buildings, um, you know, with the power on. And there is, I can't imagine anyone in America that is not paid to do so that would stand up and say to a firefighter, no, we can't change the electrical code to be able to stop that. Yeah. And so now I'm not going to cast any stones, but I have heard some organizations push back on that. I'm not going to name them, sure. but yep. um, it is my job to push back on them and say, Hey, you're saying that because your company is paying you to say that. And it has nothing to do with safety. And uh, there, yeah, go ahead. Yep, I'll tell you, if you, if you look at that, at the link I provided for the CPSC data, you can do some searches in there on electrocutions and a few of them. Uh, I did a search just, uh, I think it was yesterday just to test the link out to make sure it was the right link. And I put in electrocutions and the first two were firefighter electrocutions sure. uh, entering a building. Uh, one was on a, on a roof with photovoltaic system. And the other, I believe was just uh, ventilating a, uh, a structure. But um, so that now, whole that whole photovoltaic thing, uh, that's a completely different conversation with. Well, yeah. MD, and, 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 and then you have the other energy UCL. sources, the whole bit. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Now, the other aspect. Also, very quickly, I have to tell you that my windows just came up saying, giving me the five minute. Um, your computer is going to restart due to updates with oh. no postponed. Beautiful. That means so, you were yeah. shirking your duties. When the message was coming up before saying you need to do this, you kept saying delay, delay, delay. Mr. Procrastination. I was doing prep for this particular video. Now, what would you do if we putting it off? What if, would you do if this was like <laughs> CNN or, or, or NBC or Fox or one of the networks that you were on and you were delivering a really important message? And I mean, come on, David. I don't have to tell you. I have no excuse. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So here's the other thing is, um, so uh, there's a lot more to electrical safety in the home, 
right? right. There's the, the misuse of, of, uh, of extension cords. And there's one item that I would love to get everybody thinking about. Peninsulas and islands and the receptacles that are on those. The, the, the discussion and debate is going to happen during the 2023 cycle regarding the, that receptacle. Did we introduce a hazard by mandating a receptacle on an island or a peninsula, which will be on the face, which would promote the cord going over the edge? CPSC has some data that seems to indicate there's a concern there. And we're toying with what, is it an issue? Is it not an issue? I would love to have uh, information from anybody watching to tell me their opinions on it. I'm struggling with it because of the data and because of the amount of information that I've seen so far from the Consumer Product Safety Commission in working with Mr. Doug Lee. But I would love to know the thoughts of those watching the, this session uh, whether it is live or after the fact, because this will be on my LinkedIn, on my YouTube, and on my Facebook, I'd love to know where people's heads are at with regard to that receptacle and its placement. So um, I'd love to get some feedback on that. Nihad, Ryan Jackson. Nihad knows this is going to be a debate on panel two um, because it was we, we started down that discussion. And we've got a task group right now that John McCamish from IBW is, uh, is chairing, and we've been trying to collect data on this. So I'd love to hear some feedback on that from anybody out there who's, uh, who can share experiences or, uh, or information on their, what, where their head would be at. And my understanding is, you know, just for anybody that's trying to look up that particular um, code requirement, that is uh, Article 21052C2 off the top wow. of my head. That. Yeah. Spoken. This guy, you know what? That, you know what? That, that, I'll tell you what, David. Uh, there we go. It took me a long time. <laughs> I, I knew two articles: two ten dot eight, two ten dot twelve. For the longest time, I and 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 uh, and and you know, being able to 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 say a section number, whether you're right, wrong, it don't <laughs> yeah, matter. Right. That's the other thing. <laughs> okay. I don't know if I'm right. <laughs> the fact you went out on that limb is perfect. Oh. See, I'm I have, I'm okay on the code, the where the locations of the code stuff. I just have to learn how to restart my computer before going on to a particular live thing. We're but good. off the top of my head, I think the first requirement is going through the measurement of the square footage of the surface area of the yes. countertop, and then the second one is requiring at least one of those receptacles to be um, servicing the the end part of that particular yes. countertop. Is that right? Yep, okay. that's right. And and we don't have a specific location where you put the rest of them. We just tell you it has to be within so many. Now, so the debate, what's going to happen now is we've increased the number of receptacles on islands and peninsulas. And what the CPSC came to us and said, look, we, we have a lot of children who are pulling crock pots, pulling grease pans off of islands and peninsulas. And, and we're looking at the data and, and I'm trying to, you know, as a, as a panel member, as a licensed professional engineer, we want to do the right thing. As a manufacturer, we want to do the right thing. Uh, so we're looking at the data, try to say, what is the right thing to do? And, right. you know, do you, do you prohibit those receptacles? Do you make them optional? Do you say, if you do put them on, they have to be in the top? Uh, do you mandate that you have to put one in on the top and not on the sides of those well, uh, yeah. peninsulas? Yeah, I, mean, I know that. That's always very popular cutting into someone's countertop. That's always popular with the missus. Oh, I know that. my, yeah, my, my, I mean, my wife would not want me to cut into the top of our granite uh, peninsula. There's no way. Yeah. Yeah. We're going to keep you going until you shut down. Yeah. I'm, I'm a little bit worried about like the, I've gotten triple zeros so far down here. So I'm not sure. There it is. <laughs> you might be able to still hear me. You just might not be able to get to the video. I can, I can, there he goes. There he is. There he's done. Wait a minute. Oh, wait. Here we go. Oh, you're um, on the phone. I am on the phone. How about that? <laughs> is that <laughs> called? Do you know what that is? That is a, and it actually looks even better than your computer, David. Oh, see, there you go. This oh, you were much playing. clearer. You know what that's okay. called? That's called an automatic transfer switch. <laughs> that's an automatic transfer switch with uh, with a uh, make before break. There you go. We didn't lose you. 
I had uh, redundancy planned in. I do have the National Association of Space and Aeronautics and all that stuff on my resume. So, you know, I figured I'd live up to the name. Perfect. Fairmont, West Virginia, the IVMV Center. I think it's now the Katherine Johnson Center. But yeah, there you go. So Ryan that's, Jackson that's saying, all I have for you, by the way. Ryan Jackson says it's a problem, but we can't force three or four pop ups. Nihad says peninsulas and islands are always hot topics during CMP2 discussions. Absolutely. Yeah, 10 points. 10 points to Gryffindor? What's that? <laughs> don't. Uh, it's a, that's a, it's a Harry Potter reference. Don't, don't worry about it, Tom. I got it. Whoever said it, I got it. And it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I'm not a Harry Potter kind of guy. So we'll just yeah, drop that like a hot Tom, You're going to have to throw out some, uh, some Charlie Brown references or, uh, uh, one fish, two fish, red fish, blue fish. He's more of that kind of guy. Okay. I love it. <laughs> well, put it this way. You just got 10 points no matter what. So that's a good thing. I'll take it. He'll I think I'm in, I'm negative 90 now. So negative 90. I've, I've got 10 back. What else? What else do we got to cover? So we, we talked about, uh, we talked about, you know, proper use of extension cords. That's always a concern. And that's why we have receptacle placements and things like that. And that's what sort of sparked my mind about this peninsula and island, uh, because I'm, I'm curious to say, those who don't have a receptacle in their peninsula or island, do you really use extension cords to power things? Or like what we do in our house, uh, we don't have a receptacle on our peninsula. But if I, have, if I have something going on at the house, we put a little card table up with the crock pots and we move it over into the, either the dining area or actually it's like, it's more on the other side of the uh, kitchen wall in the living room area. We put it on the wall. There was a, there's a receptacle right there and we plug things in. We, we, I've never used an extension or in the kitchen, but I'm curious to know are extensions being used in the kitchens where you don't have a receptacle on your Island or your peninsula. So in my parents' house, they have a breakfast bar that is, uh, it's more of a peninsula than anything. And they use that receptacle that's on the wall and use a surge protector oh. to do that. And so that yeah. not only covers all of the phones being charged, but whenever mom has a crock pot and she's doing um, a buffet scenario for lasagna, yeah, uh, for her favorite son's favorite lasagna, then, um, She's able to do that and also has, you know, the necessary needed re uh, receptacles that are needed for such uh, food prep cuisine situations. So I know that is what they do. I do not know if that is um, <laughs> what you're supposed to be doing, because I would imagine that is a lot of we're adding a lot of load onto that particular circuit. But um, I mean, that then that's a completely other conversation, right? I mean, yeah, well, here's a question for you. So let's say. I have a particularly large island or peninsula that requires um, a certain amount of receptacles. I mean, at what point do you have to bump up the size of the breaker to be able to... No, you know, remember, do... remember when we figure out in a residential home... For a load sizing, for everything like that, right? For a load calculation in a residential home, you only calculate the number of res of of uh, you calculate the size but you 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 calculate the number of um feeders and branch circuit or branch circuits that you need you don't have a load calculation that you would do okay. for each branch circuit in a residential per the code now you know and we have a we have a required 20 amp circuit and and two uh branch circuits like for a kitchen and things like that right. but we don't have um like a you do a load calculation I'd be surprised if anybody did a load calculation on a branch circuit or residential home, um, like for a kitchen countertop or something like that. They put two twenty eight right. circuits, uh, and, and that's and then and then they call it a day. You, you know, if they pull in a third one, that that's an electrician going above beyond, in my opinion. I don't know what Ryan Jackson and and anybody else out there their thoughts are. Uh, well, if you have that. six air conditioners on the outside there, Ooh. then. Uh... Maybe yeah. that's not completely outside of the realm of possibility. That's just amazing, isn't it? This is one of those situations where, you know, how big does the island have to be to be, be considered a continent, you know, with Australia being an island in itself, and it's also a continent. 
So, so Ryan works. says you don't buy more appliances simply because you have more places to plug them in. Ryan, here's the thing. <laughs> Remember, I buy I buy multi-tab strips to plug more appliances in. <gasps> okay. Um Michael and I've been watching your channels and thank you for all it say Mo Moises Fuentes, thank you for uh tuning in and I appreciate the feedback. And Ryan Jackson has it his own YouTube channel as well. He does a lot of educational programs. So please check him out. Uh, check his, uh, do a search for Ryan Jackson on YouTube. Uh, check that out because he brings a lot of value to, uh, to the interweb as well. So, uh, you know, together we can make a difference. At Moises Fuentes. Yep. So Ryan, call out, shout out to Ryan Jackson. Thank you, Moises Fuentes. Hopefully I got that right. My, mi espanol es bueno, no? So I don't know. All right. So what else, David? I mean, we're we're over an hour. We're an hour and twenty five minutes. We were kicking it, rocking it, keeping everybody engaged. We got the dialogue going. We got Mr. Fuentes out there. We got. Uh, I haven't seen. I haven't seen Felix Sandoval. Usually, I see Felix Sandoval. We got Egypt online. Nihad El Sharif. It's like bedtime, past bedtime for him. He mentioned Jeez. our paper that we're writing, our IEEE paper. Um. It's all good stuff. Tom, do you want to tease on some of the uh, upcoming guests that we might have coming on? Uh, Tell them. You've been doing a great job. You've been out there <laughs> fishing. I, I, you know, let them know what's going on. So my understanding is that, uh, so number one, I talked to Rebecca Bitter, who is on our, who is an associate product manager for wiring devices at Eaton. She's going to be coming on and talking to us about, I believe it is a, um, uh, a dimmer. I can't remember what the, I think it's a vocalizing dimmer, something like that. Sorry, Rebecca. I can't remember oh, exactly I just, what no, the product name is. Uh, I just saw it announced uh, on Facebook. Let's see it. We have an, an A-L-E-X-A -A dimmer switch. You just say her name. Yeah. And, and. What's and her name? A-L-E-X-A. -A. <laughs> I can't say it because then, then, you know, she goes, what do you want? Or she'll turn things on and off. So, but yeah, we have so that built in. I just day. saw it announced on Facebook. Perfect. Excellent. So she's going to be coming on and um, talking to us about that. I think we're going to, I'm going to try to get Ian Rubio on here, the, the a product manager that was helping me out a little bit earlier. And also he'll probably correct me on um, occupancy and vacancy centers, which will be excellent. Yep. Um, and then I think you are also in contact with Jennifer Pulskina. Does that sound great? Yes, Jennifer. So Jennifer and I talked, so, you know, I, I originally was like, boy, you know, I'm going to ask people and they're going to go, oh, I don't know. I don't know. But she was like, I'm there. She's like coming up with all these ideas. I'm like, we're going to have to do multiple segments because she had some um, she had some good stuff uh, that she wanted to cover. So with regard to, I think, a little bit of that also, she's doing some stuff with, um, oh, what was it? Um, I don't know if it was alternative energy or something like that or energy storage. I can't remember. Yeah. So she's um my, we my understanding is she is a part of the uh, connected devices team and so um, along with uh, Abai Jakari and uh, a couple other uh, solution architects that I'm not sure if they have announced who those individuals will be but Eaton will be rolling out our connected devices division um, in which will absolutely involve um, EV charging and you know some of the technology that I cannot talk about on this particular program yep. that is yep. internal for right now. So um, there's a lot of cool stuff coming out of Eaton recently, and I'm going to let Jennifer kind of talk about her situation because I don't know what is um, – I don't want to let particular cats out of their individual bags, sure. and I'll let her have the uh, <laughs> yep. have the rights to do that. Right? Yep. The, the other person uh, that, that we're going to have on is Michael King from our yes, services right. division. He does a lot of training. And um, I know that guy has seen a lot of stuff. So we're going to have Michael King on as well. I'm looking, I'm going to have to do a, a spread with three of us because you're always going to be there uh, because. Uh, the we, staple. We, you're the staple. That's exactly right. <laughs> yeah. you, know, you know, I just saw this note from Bill Cosby, not Bill Cosby. Um, there you go. Yep. Not Bill Cosby. Renting a house yep. with no ground. And ran in EMT and metal boxes in the process of getting rental insurance. Any thoughts? Um, so uh, EMT can be your equipment grounding conductor. So I don't believe you have any issues there. Um, 
I, I don't I don't see any I don't think that uh, insurance companies are going to have a concern now if you had aluminum wiring that I know is a concern based upon the vintage of the home you might have a, an aluminum and no, normally the aluminum wiring I've seen it like in plans where they know these homes have aluminum wiring just from a history perspective that presents a little bit of a challenge sometimes with regard to insurance but I've never heard of anything with regard to um, uh, metal boxes and EMT and all that good stuff. That's good, solid construction. Yeah, two fifty dollars. So uh, yeah. Robert from Omaha noted two fifty dollars one eighteen. That's your equipment grounding conductor. So you're good to go. I don't have any concern. Perfect. Great. Yeah. Yep. All right. What else, uh, Mr. David? I don't know if I have anything else. I mean, we've gone over, and we've still got some people watching, which is a good thing. Can't believe it. I can't believe um, it either. <laughs> I. You know what? You've been busy all day today on, was it 70B or 70E? 70B for electrical maintenance. I'm telling I didn't you. Know that, was the Psy a part of how you pronounce it? No, no, no. It was um, uh, 70B. It, 70B, 70B. So 70B is going through their first draft meeting. And I'm telling you right now, uh, we're taking it from a, from a, um, a guide right to a from a you could do this and you know you should do this to a you shall a, a standard so we have a lot of work going on and we are our first draft meetings Monday Tuesday and Wednesday of this week Monday Tuesday and Wednesday of next week and we and we're not sure if we're going to have to add another day because you know when you're taking when you when you're you're making electrical maintenance a requirement now you really have to think about what you're requiring before you may have said, Hey, you know, you should test this or, uh, uh, look at this on a monthly basis, but then to say you're required to look at it on a monthly basis is a different discussion. So we're having those debates right now on, um, we're having those debates on, on 70 B and I tell you what there, it's a, it's a, it, it's an awesome, uh, an awesome, uh, process. And anybody can join. So all you have to do is contact NFPA. I uh, can't remember who. You go out to NFPA seven NF, NFPA.org slash 70 B next. And it's think it's Sarah. Is it Sarah Caldwell? I think it's Sarah. You send her a note and um you let her know that you wanna, you know, be a guest and just watch and listen. But uh, the discussions can be dry. Um, you know, you've got to really be in the mood to talk about some of the stuff that we're talking about, but it is really a good discussion. And we're going to have a good document for first draft for people to comment on. So good stuff. Yeah. Those are so, all the updates that I have. The only thing I might consider noticing just, just for everyone that made it so long here, if you're in the state of Maine, um, they just had a uh, rulemaking hearing last week and off the top of my head, um, I'm not able to access my notes obviously, um, right now. <laughs> but uh, off the top of my head, I believe they included some extra exceptions for uh, 210.8A, well, 210.8F, yeah, I should say. Yeah. Um, essentially, they added sump pumps and a, a heating pumps, um, I think water pumps, a couple couple different things that um, they, they were worried about, particularly freezing um, for the GFCI protection for outdoor outlets for 210.8F. And then I believe they um, got rid of the requirement for 23067 for SPDs. Uh, that's off the top of my head. They have not announced any type of effective date yet for the 2020 AC in Maine, but um, those are those are just uh, it's a little bit of information for anybody that's still on the uh, the call here. And then we'll yeah. I think that'll be our tenth NEC 2020 active state, um, and wow. it's going to be a busy year 2021. I can tell you that because. Yep. Um, probably half to two thirds of the states that normally would have done it on year one of the code cycle um, actually did adopt so far. Um, so now we have the carryover of what normally would be done in the first year. And then we have everyone that's normally in year two of the code cycle adopting at the same time as everyone who bottlenecks and, you know, kicked right. and punted essentially. And so I plan on essentially everything looks like it's going to be uh, hitting right around Q3 and Q4 for 2021. And so I am just going to be taking the entire June month vacation because I'm not going to be able to take any of it at the end of this year. 
With I'm glad it's you and not me, yeah. brother, because I used That's to do right, that. That's right, yeah. It's just going to be me holding the fort with uh, my uh, mistletoe and, yep. you know, just wrapping myself with um, And you'll be out uh, there with Christmas Tim. Lights. You'll be out there with Tim McClintock and, That's right. uh, and Mike uh, Stone and all the Neo yep. Field reps uh, and Brian and, and crew and, uh, the, you know, and, and a bunch of other, because I know when I used to do that, it was the same group of individuals standing up at the mic fighting for safety. Uh, I always said, I wish I saw more distributors out there. I saw, I wish I saw more electricians uh, and more inspectors standing up at the mic saying, Hey, you know, this ain't right. We need to, uh, we need to support electrical safety. Speaking anybody who is possibly listening out there, if you ever yeah. want to be involved with the process, please reach out to me, David A. Smith at E.com. We would love to have more advocates for safety in general um, throughout the country. And so whatever state that you're in, you know, please reach out because, you know, we're always looking for someone to be, um, you know, the side of the good guys, I guess. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Wear the white hats and, and get out there and right. ride up on the horse and save the day. So, and, and, you know, come, you know, you're dis, you are disadvantaged like I'm disadvantaged because you're a manufacturer and people think the reason you're standing up at the mic is because you're selling product. And you just want another sale. But they lose sight of the fact that you're also there because you don't want to end up in court because because somebody was killed or hurt or a house burned down and they're blaming you for that. It's a liability thing. And and you know, there's it's not just about selling product. I mean, and if if I'm in court, you know who else is gonna be in, in that same seat? It's the electrician. It's, yep. it's, it's the electrical contractor. It's the, uh, it's the distributor. It's anybody who was associated with that project. I remember, you know, poor, poor Rinaldi, uh, down in Florida who was electrocuted. He was delivering of all things. He was delivering a dryer and he pushed the, he pushed the, uh, the, the, um, the, the pipe that the, the exhaust from the dryer through the wall and he was killed. And and they and it was our panel board, you know. And when I read that incident in the news, I immediately jumped on it. I was like, "We need GFCI protection." And and what it was was it was uh, metal framing, NM wire and metal framing, and the wire was nicked by a screw. It energized the entire infrastructure of the news channel, and and the the link is no longer active. I've been trying to find it ever since. But the news channel actually showed the electrician in a home. And he was, he was in a bathroom and he opened up the medicine cabinet. He put a, a one lead on the medicine cabinet, the other on the faucet. And he says, I got 120 volts right here. Oh. Okay. So, well, they were, you know, the, unfortunately the, you know, everybody was on the, uh, was on the litigation thing. And I, I couldn't say much on it because we were a part of that. And it wasn't until everything settled at the end saying, look, it was a freak accident. There was no, uh, fault. It was. It wasn't anybody's fault. It wasn't the electrician's fault. It wasn't the uh, the the uh, uh, dr the guy who uh, drilled the. Um, it was. It was drywall. The 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 drywallers. It wasn't his fault. Nobody could have foreseen the issues that happened that caused this death. And it's unfortunate because a family lost their father, and and husband. And at the end of the day, who's to blame? Nobody. Right. But we could have designed yeah. something so much better to save that life it didn't have to happen so you look at stuff like that and you say and which is which is which is why you know events like and discussions like this are healthy because we are in a position to influence change but we're yet we're at a disadvantage we get the emails you get the emails of hey this person died on this home we see the statistics but yet we're at that disadvantage and we need other people in the industry to step up to the plate and stand up at the microphone and say, I care. And this doesn't need to happen. And we need to defend our codes and standards and the proper way to design and, and build a safe home. Nobody should die in their residential home where you should feel the safest, in my opinion. What's Ryan saying? I'm yeah, I was gonna say I have nothing to add to that because I think you've said it very well. Oh yeah, I, you know, I, get, I get very passionate about it because it's when you when you talk to families and you talk to people, it starts to really hit home. And then you realize this is not just about selling a product. This is not just about 
about uh, protecting your liabilities and whatnot. It's about saving lives. Ryan said he had a fatality from a dryer. Uh, he showed that uh, to our state legislature, but the home, the HBA's voice was louder than mine. GFCI expansion were not accepted in my home state. Yeah, Ryan, but you know what? I got to commend you for stepping up to the plate. That's that's the first where, step. Do you know where Ryan is, by the way? Ryan is, are you out of Florida, Ryan? I'm not sure. That's a good question. I think I think it's the Southern, I think he's out of I, I might be mixing mixing up. I'm not sure. Utah. Jeez, okay. oh, man. Yeah, that's right. Utah. Well, Ryan, uh, Utah is going to be firing up their residential um, uh, stuff here pretty soon. I think they're pretty much done with their commercial uh, for the 2020 NEC. And um, I hate to say that Utah tends to be one of the more, well, he already knows this, um, higher amended states. Yeah. Uh, and so that certainly seems to be the case for the 2020 EC for commercial. It's pretty much locked in. However, um, I think the electrical subcommittee of the UBCC out in Utah just um, started kicking off their um, review of the 2020, or I guess I should say the 2018 I codes. Yeah. Um, and so they're going to be going through the residential codes right now. And so um, please, you know, it's going to be me out there. It's going to be Mike Stone. It's going to be, um, Chris Jensen. Uh, oh yeah, Chris. Who is our yeah? Chris Jensen is our um, Sherpa whenever it comes to Utah. You know, he's he's the guy. He knows what's going right? on out there. I think he's a former chair of that particular committee. I'm not sure if it's the UBCC or the Electrical Subcommittee, but um, he's definitely um, our man with the plan out there. And hopefully, we might be able to get some headway whoever comes to the 2020 NEC in yep. Utah and try to gain back some of the ground that we've lost in. AFCI, GFCI, yeah. and you know all the different other articles that are hugely important to safety, but are politically contentious for what other what, for some organizations uh, over others. And uh, he already listed the particular organization, but I will not mention yep. them by name. Yep. So uh, you mentioned Mike Stone. Mike Stone is our NEMA field rep out on the West sure. Coast. He's going to be on here. I, I talked to him about doing a program. He's going to be engaged. Also, I talked to Jeff Fecto from UL. He's going to be on here. Uh, maybe we can get Ryan Jackson involved. I don't know. I have a feeling. I have got a feeling. So that would be kind of cool uh, to do a program with Ryan Jackson. Um, but in any case, uh, we're going to have some really good stuff coming up. So Tuesdays and Thursdays now, Tuesdays and Thursdays, five o'clock. We were supposed to go from five to six. It is six freaking 42. Yeah. So uh, whenever I was like, oh, my computer is going to be updating at 615. You know, it'll be after yep. all of our stuff. Don't worry about it. And what I'm going to do is I'm taking all of this material and putting that over on our podcast. So uh, for those who want to listen to this, they can. They can tune in to uh, – I put the links in down below – so uh, we, we knew to put faces on these incidents. Otherwise, people tend to think of statistics as numbers and not lives. Nihad, you are right. absolutely right. You know, it's, it's, and that's what makes it personal for me. And I get, you know, when you, when you talk to, you know, when you talk to uh, Rinaldi and, and his family, and when you, when you talk to um, uh, Lucas Ritz's father, his parents, uh, Lucas passed away in a marina, it, it gets real really quick. It's very easy as engineers, as electricians, as, as designers to be disassociated with and not as intimate with the actual loss of life or loss. If you, if you didn't lose your home, life, if you lost your home, just think about all of your worldly, all of your possessions, all your family pictures, everything, your history gone because of what an event that could have been prevented, you know, and that's the way I look at it. So you got to put that exclamation point and marry that, uh, that real world scenario. So I appreciate you, Nihad and uh, Ryan and Robert from Omaha, you know, Nebraska, he's got the same thing with 210.8F going on. So it is what it is. And uh, that's what we do. David Smith out there in the cold, in the bustling wind, Fighting the travel, living in uh, in hotels that uh, 
that you wouldn't want to live in a hotel that that's like that, you know, for a long period of time. I can just see it. I can see it. This is like, uh, this is the dressed up David, but when he's out there, man, he's fighting the storm. So I appreciate that's what right. you do. I've that's been right. there. Hey, I know what you glad do. To have I know it means a lot. Absolutely. Glad to be a part of it. Um, you know, it's, it's a, it's a job that we can all be passionate about, which is kind of the cooler part of this. Yep. You know, there are some people that, dread the the nine to five or eight to five that they do or something like that. But, uh, you know, having a manager like Kevin Arnold, uh, you don't have to worry about putting a fire under it. I can tell you there that. There you go. That's right. <laughs> Kevin's a good guy. Maybe we'll get him on here too, talking about something. I think he'd really like that. Yeah, that would be cool. All right, brother. From another mother. Really, that's right. I really enjoyed it. All of these are very important conversations. I'm glad we're having them. Thank yep. you, everybody that signed on here and everyone that contributed to the chat. Um, yep. You know, please, you know, as much as you can, uh, please submit any type of questions whenever it comes to this channel or go on Eaton Tech Talk, the hashtag Eaton Tech Talk. Essentially, if you go on there for LinkedIn or Facebook or YouTube, um, all of these videos are going to be tagged that way. So if you're on YouTube, click that, then it'll get all the other Eaton Tech Talk videos. If you're on LinkedIn, click on that hashtag, then it'll go to the, our entire archive. For this particular thing. If you want to email me at David A. Smith at Eaton.com, I believe yours, Tom, is Tom A. Dimitrovich at Eaton.com. Thomas or A. Thomas, it's, pardon yeah, me. Thomas, yep. it's, a, it's as long as I could possibly get it. Thomas A. Dimitrovich at Eaton.com. Yeah. Perfect. Uh, yep. Yeah. And you have, have it written right there so uh, you can uh, you can look that up. But please reach out to me or reach out to Tom if you want to be featured on the show or if you have any questions or materials that you'd like us to yeah, go over. Point. Um, and you know, Tom, Tom could probably look up all the books that he has behind him there and figure out something to present here. It just Absolutely. will be good, good news. I'm still working on building my, uh, <laughs> my stuff. You know, I just have a blank wall for right now, but you know, Tom, thanks very much for letting me be a part of it. And thank, thank you everybody nope. for, uh, for, you know, caring enough about all of this and safety to yeah. educating yourself. And I, and pardon me, Tom, I think we're, thinking about having some type of um, credits that could possibly go out for these types of situations. Oh yeah. Um, so I'm working, working with the, on that. Yeah. I'm working with the West Virginia chapter IEI to try to get, uh, uh, especially for the Thursday tech talks, the two hour programs there to get CU credits. We're going to have the West Virginia chapter meeting, uh, which will be live April 6th and 7th. We will have CU credits for those. Uh, they can sign up for that. Go to the, uh, just, if you just Google IAEI West Virginia, you'll find it. There's a link there for registration. Uh, it's eight hours worth of CU credits for 50 bucks. If you're an IAEI member, that is ridiculously inexpensive, but our goal as a chapter is to give back to, uh, the, uh, the community. And we're going to do that with uh, lower cost, uh, some educational items. So, uh, and I'll be hopefully providing, being able to provide some CEU credits uh, moving forward. So working with that organization, IAEI membership has its benefits. So this Perfect. could just be one of them. How about that? How about that? How about that? Awesome, David. Thank you for hanging in there. Thanks for the hot swap on the, uh, on the phone there. That was really good. Uh, I, that was very impressive. I was impressed. And Ryan Jackson was impressed. James Smith was impressed. Nihad was like, his, I, I could just see his mouth was open like, oh, my gosh, I can't believe he did that. That was just amazing. It was amazing. That Acrobatic was like, stuff here. <laughs> I could see all the judges with tens, tens, tens. That was just beautiful, brother. That was awesome. Hey, I'm here to, to provide everything, including Circus Olay or whatever. So uh, Circus Olay. I'm, I'm here to entertain. Come here at 5 o'clock on Tuesday. <laughs> Try the you veal. You never know what you're going to do next. That's right. <laughs> Tip your waitresses. <laughs> That's perfect. All right, David and everybody out there. I think we've uh, spent our time. Well, I appreciate you, David. I appreciate everybody dialing in. Thanks for joining us for another eat and tech talk uh, and look forward to doing more. See you next. See you this Thursday and I'll see you next Tuesday. All right. See you guys. All righty. Thank you, sir. And I am going to, uh, I am going to put us, and fade us out and shut us off. Remember, stay safe and stay healthy.